Good morning, chemistry team. Chemistry coach coming at you for video number eight in our chemical equations and reactions journey. And we're going to go into a new land today. We're going to go into solutions because the majority of the chemical reactions that you'll run in undergraduate kind of general chemistry laboratories will be occurring in solution with solutions you'll mix some solutions you go into any undergraduate chemistry laboratory and you'll see solutions all over the place so we need to look at that a little bit you probably already know or have a basic idea what solutions are but <clears throat> i want to get you thinking literally down to the molecular level of what's occurring if a reaction is occurring <clears throat> what what's going on in solution and so we have to have some definitions of what's what uh, and I find a lot of students lose track of what they're talking about. So we're going to really nail that down and use very crystal clear language on what the reacting species are if we are having a reaction occur in a solution. So we got to define the parts of a solution and how we can track things. And then how do we do uh, equation writing? We're going to do that in the next uh, chapter. Uh, how to represent reactions occurring in solution through equations. We're going to do that in the next chapter. Um, but what we're going to do in this one is how do we track stoichiometry? Because the key to this chapter is stoichiometry, how we relate reactants to products or reactants to other reactants. But since so many of our reactions are occurring in solution, let's take a look at that and how we're going to track it. So first, let's look at it qualitatively. Then we'll look at it quantitatively with uh, concentration, which I know you've all heard that term, but we're going to really nail that down. <laughs> let's have some fun. All right, solutions, of course. A solution is just a term for saying homogeneous mixture. And we did that in the you know very, very beginning of this class, looking at what a homogeneous mixture is versus a heterogeneous mixture. So a solution technically is a homogeneous mixture, Right, where you got two or more species uh, mixed evenly throughout. So if we looked at it, it would look like one single substance. A lot of them, if they're clear and colorless, look like water, but they're not. <laughs> All right. So of course, it's going to have multiple parts. Um, so just to keep it fairly simple, let's just say we dissolve something in something else. Right, we're mixing them in. So what is being dissolved is the solute. And that's typically going to be the species that's undergoing the chemical reaction. And what's doing the dissolving is the solvent. So almost always the solvent's in greater amount and the solute is less amount, right? You're cooking, you got a pot of water, you sprinkle some salt in there, shoop, the salt disappears. The salt is the solute, the water is the solvent in that scenario. You know, common sense, pretty, pretty, even if people aren't scientists, I think they understand that. Um, so what we need to be able to do when we're doing reactions and uh, quantitatively looking at them doing stoichiometry, we need to extract out of the mixture, the solution, the information of the reacting species, the solute. Because the solvent usually is not what's reacting, so we have to kind of ignore that. But the information given to us is about the solution as a whole. Right? So in, in real quick... The solution, the homogeneous mixture, and we looked at this a couple chapters ago, can be any phase, right? I could have a metal dissolved in a, you know, mixed with another metal, an alloy, right? Of certain percentages. And what's nice about this is you can have pretty much, because it's a mixture, you can have any kind of percentage you want. And we'll look at different ways of measuring the amount of solute in the solution, called the concentration, of course. Um, you could have two gas phase species, right? Something does in, in air, right? What's the concentration of nitrogen or oxygen in air? So we could think of air as a solution um, and alloys are solid solutions. But 99.9% .9 of the time in the undergraduate laboratories, the solvent's going to be a liquid. So when we think of solution, we almost always think of it being a liquid, right? But it isn't technically, but most of the time it is. And if, and in our case, always, the solvent is water, pure water. Remember, you use deionized water, not tap water. Ha <laughs> because tap water is a mixture, not pure. We're going to call that an aqueous solution. So that's where you get that symbol AQ. And we've already looked at that. We have solid liquid gas, and now we have AQ. And that AQ represents a solute 
that's been dissolved in some solvent, which happens to be water in this case. So if I mix two solutions together like that, the reacting particles, whether they're ions or molecules, will react, but in a water matrix. So we got to extract that information and, and get out of the water. The water's not reacting, it's the solute particles. And that's where concentration is going to come into play. So let's look at that qualitatively and quantitatively real quick. Here's an example of what you might see. And we've run into this when we've balanced equations because we've already been introduced to the AQ symbol. We just haven't looked in gory detail on it. We're really going to hit it qualitatively in the next chapter when we do reactions. So we're just doing basic chemical reactions in this chapter. Next one, we're going to do reactions that occur in aqueous solution. Woo! It's a whole new world. Okay, anyway. So here's an example of a reaction. Let's say we take some solid copper, plop it in a solution of silver nitrate. Very cool, by the way. If you watch it, um, and copper, the copper two ion has kind of a bluish color, uh, and the silver nitrate's actually clear and colorless. So if you do this reaction, you pop, you know what copper looks like. Pop it in there. Put in the silver nitrate, so you got this copper wire or foil sitting in this what looks like water, but it's a silver nitrate solution. And over time, you'll start to see this kind of a dark gray turning you know, over time, kind of this silvery color solid coating on the outside of the copper. It's really neat. And that's solid silver that's plating out on the copper. And then the solution starts to turn a light blue color because of the copper to nitrate. Now, we'll look in next... Uh, the next chapter on how species exist in aqueous solution. We'll look at how does like copper two nitrate really exist in solution? How does silver nitrate really exist in solution? Not critical right now. We're interested more in how we deal with stoichiometry for equations in solution. So if I want to track this, for example, if I want to say, you know, hey, how many grams of silver played out given a certain amount of this solution, say, and usually it's since it's a liquid, we'll be measuring out, so say we measured out, you know, 8.51 milliliters or 22.6 milliliters. We need to get to moles of the reacting species, right? The silver nitrate solution is not what reacts. The water does not react. Remember, the solution is the silver nitrate salt dissolved in the water. And we'll find out later the silver nitrate breaks up into silver ions and nitrate ions. So we need to extract out of this information on the silver nitrate solute itself. Well, how do we do that? So again, we need information that tells us how much of that solute there is in that solution. And, gonna, and that's what concentration is. And we're going to go through several videos on all the different types of concentration units. <laughs> Man, there's a lot of them. Each have their own uses and purposes. Some are better in some situations. Some are not so good in certain situations. Um, but qualitatively, you know, not quantitatively, qualitatively, Concentration is just how much solute you have over how much solution. Kind of a part over whole, right? Almost like a, a fraction or a ratio. If I've got this amount of the entire solution, the entire mixture, how much of just that portion of it, the solute, do I have? Now, next semester, we'll get into some where we have amount of solute over the amount of solvent, something called molality. We'll look at that later, but not this semester, not first semester general chemistry. It'll always be the amount of sol solute over the amount of solution. And what's really cool is we can use that as a conversion factor from units of solution to units of solute. It allows us to take information about the solution and change it into information on the solute. That's the purpose of concentration in a dimensional analysis or stoichiometry problem. Of course, we can all use it, also use it just to say, hey, here's a solution. How much solute is in there? And the general terms we have are, is there a lot of solute? <sighs> just pour a bunch in there. Or is just a little tiny bit, right? So maybe we had a solution. We added a bunch of water, so we have more solution, right? Um, so if we increase the denominator by adding a whole bunch more water, it decreases the concentration of it. So we'll look at dilution in a little bit as well. So if there's a large amount of solute, we just call that a concentrated solution. Those are usually the ones that are stored in a, in a fume hood or a special um, safe um, you know, place that is sometimes locked up. You want to use, you know, if it's an acid, you want to use acid gloves on that. That could hurt pretty bad, trust me. And if there's not a lot of solute in there, we call that dilute. That's typically what you're going to be using 
uh, in the undergraduate uh, first semester of general chemistry laboratory. So we're not going to we're not going to break out the concentrated solutions for you in most scenarios. It'll probably be dilute. Of course, you know it probably won't hurt if it gets on you, but you want to wash your hands off and stuff if you get it on there. Of course, if it's in your eye, fifteen minutes in the eye wash, my friends. So let's look at the purpose of concentration. I talked about it, right? Only two purposes. I'll, I'll list those up on the next board. And then we'll go through the different types of concentrations uh, and then look at the specific uses and examples in later videos. All right, I stated this before, but let's officially put it down. We got two purposes we're gonna see in this class for what we're gonna do with concentration. First and foremost, it's a quantitative measure of how much solute you have in a particular solution. We need that information to tell us, you know, well, do we need, how safe do we need to be of this? Where do we need to store this? And if I use this and I want to do a stoichiometrical calculation with it, I need that number. Um, or if we make a solution in the laboratory, right, which a lot of people do, if you're working in the stock room, um, preparing labs. I've prepared a lot of different labs myself, and I need to make a specific concentration of a solution. So I need to be able to do a calculation to say, well, hey, I want to make, you know, this solution, so I need to weigh out this much of the solute and add it to this much uh, deionized water. We'll talk about making solutions in the lab. We're going to get really good at that. Because you don't want to calculate it correctly and then make it incorrectly. <laughs> and then it's too dilute or something, or it's higher or lower concentration than you thought it should be because you don't know how to actually physically make it a laboratory. That's a big problem. So we need that information, right, if we're going to be making solutions or using solutions. But for us, the main thing we're going to do, because we're going to be doing uniline equations in dimensional analysis problems, converting a rea you know, reactant to product amounts, something like that, so that concentration is just a conversion factor. It's one more step in our unit line equation chain that allows us to convert from solution units to solute units or solute units to solution units. If I start with solution volume, I should be able to get to the amount of solute, whatever units they are, depends on the concentration you're using, concentration units. Or if I'm starting with solute, and I want to figure out how much solution there is from that, I can just flip the conversion factor upside down, the concentration, to go from solute to solution. So solution to solute, solute to solution, it's just uh, the inverse uh, from one to the other. So we have to learn how to go both ways, use it both directions. Um, by far, if you want to put a star next to this one, that's the most we're going to use this for. And, and just don't overcomplicate it. It's just a way to convert solution to solute. That's all it is. Just like a balanced chemical equation allows you to go from reactant to product or one species to any other species with a mole to mole ratio, a, a concentration a value is just a conversion factor from units of solution to units of solute or vice versa. So what we're going to do is uh, look at, I'm going to break up two videos past this, and we'll break up, there's a lot of different kinds of solution concentrations we're going to look at. We're going to look at molarity, which most of you have seen in intro chemistry or high school chemistry. We're going to look at the, the, the evil, bizarro cousin of molarity called normality. Oh, <laughs> real, real, but it's a nice little trick for if you're dealing with acid and base, sometimes redox chemistry. We're going to look at percent units, mass percent, volume percent, and how to deal with those. Pretty much we'll leave it with that. We'll do some weirder ones next semester. Um, like I mentioned, molality. We'll look at mole percent, a couple of weird ones. Um, so we'll cut this, this general introduction to solutions over, and we'll do some very specific calculations with concentration units in the next one. Keep going, guys!